This is Histories and Mysteries. I'm Ashley. And I'm Jessica. And on this week's episode, Ashley is going <laughs> to be talking about severed feet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All I got out of her. And I am going to be doing a story on the horrible Sean Vincent Gillis. And unfortunately, we found that we have a little bit of a theme this week, which is severed feet, which is not a great theme. (laughs) Thankfully, mine is very short lived and it's just in passing. Okay. okay, But yeah, we were worried that we had the same story. (laughs) So enjoy. (laughs) <laughs> also, for those of you that are watching, if you're wondering about my background, my uh, back wall still painting isn't done. I'll give you a little sneak peek here. Uh, all the mess <laughs> that is my background. So we are just doing a little pirate ship. And uh, yeah, I wanted just to, wanted to get in on the, on the pirate. <laughs> <laughs> Eye patch and hat. <laughs> All right. Well, um, my story's not long, but I googled great mysteries, and this one came up, and I I had to do it. So, um, I got my sources from an awesome article in Medium written by Skylar Aries, and then also National Geographic. Oh, nice! I'm so excited to go to. Oh, I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> okay. I thought we were going to the National Geographic Museum, and then I realized it was the Smithsonian. Yeah, Smithsonian. All right. On August 20th, 2007, in Jedediah Island, British Columbia, Canada, a 12-year-old girl was walking down the beach enjoying the, I'm going to assume, fall day since she's in Canada. I'm assuming by August 20th, you guys are pretty cold by then. (laughs) yes oh my stupid microphone um okay so (laughs) as she was walking she came upon a men's size 12 running shoe as is normal for little kids curiosity got the best of her and she looked inside the shoe where she saw a sock pretty normal but then she looked in the sock and there was something there a foot to her horror and probably the horror of her future therapist the little girl found a severed foot six days later on gabriola island um a nice vancouver couple were hiking by the sea and saw a reebok shoe another man uh, men's size 12 and upon further investigation, they also found it to contain a severed foot. Ugh. What's now, the worst? What's like the worst severed thing that gives you like the heaps? Arms. Arms? Arms. Oh. Uh, mine is definitely like feet. Yeah. And then fingernails. Oh, God. Fingernails. Oh. Yeah, fingernails. <laughs> yeah, oh. that'd be awful. <laughs> like whatever oh. they talk about when people are like scraping so much that they're like fingernails. Can- yeah. Not. Um, <laughs> my other question though is like, if you were hiking, right? You're hiking down a beach. You see a shoe. I would just like walk by. I don't think oh. I would investigate it. Would you? It depends if it's like in the middle of the pathway and it looks kind of weird true 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 then yeah i'd probably yeah. pick it up but if it's just kind of like off to the side like along the way yeah oh no. yeah <laughs> um so they also realized that these two shoe findings were not from the same person because they were both right feet Ugh. Oh, that's like the worst. I don't know why. Like the right foot's just the worst. <laughs> so since those two shoes were found, nineteen more feet in shoes have washed up on the shore in both the USA and Canada 
but the USA only had like six and Canada's had the rest. Ew. Yeah. The area is called the Salish Sea. I believe that's how you say it, which includes the Puget Sound near Seattle and like a little bit south all the way up to, um, that's a typo. (laughs) I wrote toe desolation sound. Not what I want. Um, all the way up to another sound that's in Canada. And obviously the sea is cold. It's super far up north. Uh, apparently the average temperature of the water is 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius, which can cause hypothermia in under an hour. Oh, wow. Which made me wonder, uh, FYI, the Titanic water was negative 2.2 Celsius or 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So. I don't know. I just that I saw the cold water. And I was like, I wonder what the temperature of the Titanic water was. So <laughs> just a random FYI there. <laughs> Fun facts with that. <laughs> Fun facts. <laughs> um so what are some of the theories of why all these feet are showing up? Dead bodies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> One early theory was a plane crash. There was a plane that crashed in 2005 near Quandra Island. People thought that the bodies, this is really gross. People surmised that their bodies were eaten by the invertebrates (laughs) that inhabit the Salish Sea. But with shoes being so buoyant, their feet rose to the top and floated ashore. Yeah, but it just doesn't make sense if it's not the same feet. Well, there was only five people on that plane, plane too. And so far, 21 feet have been discovered. So it wasn't the plane mm. crash. So where are all these feet coming from? Uh, different theories have suggested a serial killer, uh, mafia dumping grounds. Uh, some people even say aliens. There's always aliens. Or uh, some immigrants who are possibly coming over like in one of those containers. Uh, and they were dumped at the bottom of the sea. And of course, where there is mystery, there are assholes. Some and people mysteries. Have... <laughs> <laughs> Some people have put animal paw skeletons in shoes on beaches to mimic the shoes found. Others have put raw meat inside of them. Disgusting as like Ew. a prank or a hoax. Why? Oh. Yeah, and the police said that they'll prosecute anyone who does that. <laughs> yeah. Anywho. DNA has been able to figure out who some of these feet belong to. So that very first one that the little girl who is most likely in therapy now found belonged to a man who had been missing since 2004 and had been battling severe depression. Police think he most likely jumped off a bridge in that area to die by suicide. Another foot belonged to a woman who had also jumped off the bridge and her matching foot was found as well. Another foot belonged to Stefan Zaharuko, a fisherman who went missing in 1987. They believe that his boat capsized. And the most recent foot belonged to a man named Antonio Neal, who was 22 years old when he went missing in December of 2016. His case is still open and his family believes that something bad had happened to him. According to this article, only nine of the 21 feet have been linked to someone. And a study by, in 2007 by forensic scientist Gail Anderson tried to bring some more insight as to why all these feet are washing up. Uh-huh. So she threw some pig carcasses into the sea. And d- this is so gross. <laughs> Determined that the creatures on the seafloor can, quote, strip a carcass in as little as four days. Uh-huh. So they think that because ankles are make, made up of soft tissue and just like that little itty bitty bone in there, um, that the sea creatures could easily eat the ankle and then the feet would float up because of the buoyancy of the shoe. Another theory is that these people had drowned and decomposed, but their feet were kind of protected from the waves and the creatures because they were in the shoes. So they didn't decay as quickly and also because like the coldness of the water so they didn't decay as quickly so they were able to kind of survive the feet survived longer than the rest of the body 
so, so sorry what was the time span of all these feet being found 2007 to the most recent one was 2019 uh, and how many feet you said 21 21 feet it's a lot of drown drownings right it's a lot of drownings even in that kind of like 12 year span yeah so That's, they do have oh. some there's three things that they say could kind of lean into this is that the large and complex inland of the salish sea acts as a natural trap for anything that might float so anything in that area that would have drowned or been dumped really would kind of float back to that area and the prevailing winds push the debris into the area rather than like blowing it out to sea yeah also people tend to wear sneakers to the beach in the pacific northwest because of how it's generally cold um so more feet and sneakers more chances for accidents more feet washed ashore blah 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 on a side note at least three (laughs) of the feet found were most likely from children Uh. which makes people even more suspicious of foul play although i can see kids just like accidentally like goofing and i i was just about to say who the heck goes swimming with their shoes on yeah so more likely they fell yeah yeah and especially if it's like yeah it just seems really weird because they were probably wearing socks which helped to keep everything kind of in the shoe Mm mm-hmm Ugh. yeah so there's no working theory for it i mean the i mean there's working theories but there's no like answer for it the scientists and police are most likely saying it's just like random drownings and stuff but i don't know man that's a lot that's a almost, lot almost two a year yeah I, I yeah i guess when you put it that way that's not too many yeah I could kind of see it also being like an area for dumping of bodies. Like if there is a serial killer, or like the mafia or something dumps bodies there, you know. Are there Canadian mafias? I'm gonna Google it. <laughs> <laughs> there is the Rizzuto crime family, uh, based in Montreal. Montreal, okay. Montreal. Montreal. <laughs> Montreal. How do you say it? <laughs> Montreal. That was like M U N, Montreal. I know. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. 10 most notorious Canadian mafia. So, yeah, you guys do have mafias. That's cool. Yeah. You learn something every day. You know. So, it was short, but that is my story on these random severed feet that keep popping up in Canada. And technically, the scientists said they're not severed, they're detached, but, yeah. Well, I have never heard of that. And I am a Canadian. (laughs) But, in my defense, I've never been to Western Ontario. Yeah, I've never been to the Western part of the United States either. Yeah, I've only been to the East Coast and back, but I've never gone further west than Ontario. Yeah, I haven't gone. Well, I mean, I lived in Arizona, so that's pretty far west, but I haven't been like to the Northwest. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hear about some more severed feet. I told you it's very, it's very brief. (laughs) Good, good, good. The severed feet is very brief. Let me get this all situated. Oh. Hello, bad man. Let's talk about you today. Oh, that's a big old thing. Okay. Are we excited or what? Yeah. Because I'm ready to party. All right. <clears throat> sorry so i used a couple of different resources i obviously oh. used my all that's interesting oh yes i have to <laughs> and the aetv 
real crime oh mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whatever that is i don't know i think it's american yeah it sounds american sean vincent gillis experienced a very challenging childhood as do they all it seems of course a short time after Gillis was born in 1962, his alcoholic and mentally unstable father left the house. He was a quiet boy in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and little Gillis seemed to fare well despite the challenges of growing up without a father. His mother, who worked full-time at a local television station, raised him with the help of his grandparents. She recalls Gillis during this time as a decent boy with average academic performance. <laughs> decent. That's, that's a great description of someone. Yeah. Despite having friends in high school, he occasionally displayed a, a violent side. Oh, no. At three in the morning, one of his neighbors heard a loud banging sound and saw Gillis in his front yard banging ferociously on numerous trash cans. The neighbor said he was prone to fits of anger like that. Oh. He was a young boy who was upset. How old was he? In high school. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Get that kid some anger management. After graduating from high school, uh, Gillis attended a small community college and alternated between low-wage jobs while continuing to live at home with his mother. When he turned 30, Gillis's mother left him for the first time on his own when she accepted a job in Atlanta. Gillis rapidly developed a sense of loneliness and fascination with pornography that led him to ignore his work. Oh, I mean, like everybody watches porn, but when it gets in the way of your work, that's that's when you got an issue. Yeah. yeah. Gillis's mother frequently sent him money to make up for his unemployment. However... He was still upset that his mother had left and periodically yelled out in anger, which upset his neighbors. Even more concerning, he was discovered in 1992 peering through a neighbor's window as his obsession with pornography was growing. Ooh, so he's becoming a voyeur. Yes. He managed to start and maintain a relationship with Terry Lemoyne in 1994 despite this. But he also murdered his first victim that year. Oh, no. Later, Gillis claimed that he had only made an attempt to rape Anne Bryan, 81 years old, in March. He lost control as she screamed, and then he stabbed her 50 times. Oh, he only meant to rape her, you know. Yeah, and he just ended up murdering her. Oops-a-daisy. Yeah, 81 years old. No. She was primarily stabbed in the head, chest, and genitalia. <gasps> oh, no. That's he awful. Was, and he was so close to beheading her. <gasps> oh. Meanwhile, Gillis's interest in pornography brought him to websites that showed women being raped, slaughtered, and dismembered. He even showed Lemoyne, his girlfriend, a picture of a dead woman, but she disregarded it and kept dating him. Funny. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. Lemoyne never could have anticipated what would happen years later. Oh, no. Oh, no. Despite the brutality of Anne Bryan's murder, Gillis would wait five years before killing again. And Catherine Ann Hall was her name, and she was 29 years old. Between January 1999 and January 2000, he killed four more women, bringing his total to five. In October 2000, he killed a sixth person, and in October 2003 and February 2004, 
he killed two more people. I don't, I, I was just thinking in my head, I don't like how recent this is. Like, I know, I know there's serial killers out there right now. I know there are. But like to hear about one in the 2000s, it's, I was like, oh, that's too close to home. And then I realized yeah. that, that was still like 20 years ago. <laughs> so, oh my yeah. God. Yeah. It's crazy to think about that. Because usually when you hear serial killers, you know, it's in the 70s. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we have a serial killer somewhere in Ontario right now. There is one suspected in Chicago. It's not, I don't know like how true it is, but I saw a couple TikToks about it and people, um, young men leaving the bars are going missing and winding up in the river in Chicago. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. I can't, like, I can't imagine. Ugh. So in May 1999, while Hardy Schmidt, 52, is out jogging, Gillis struck her with his car and killed her. Joyce Williams, 36. Like on purpose? Yeah. That's such a weird way to. Well, she was jogging, right? Yeah, but still, like, I I don't know. It's just such a weird way for a serial killer to kill someone because there's no, like, personal you know what i mean like they can't i mean get personal with it i guess it's yeah just, but so like gross. he his at like he he's had such a broad mo like his first victim was in her 80s and then there's one in their 20s another in their 50s this next one joyce williams was 36 who he murdered in november 1999 yeah and then another was 50s again 30s 40s so it's just all over the place yeah um but just to like make the victims known they also included lillian gorham robinson who was 52 merrick marilyn nevels who was 38 joni may williams who was 45 and a close acquaintance to gillis oh and Donna Bennett Johnson, who is 43. So just awful. Like, I just, especially when you do it to somebody you know, yeah. right? Well, and usually that's so surprising because that can be so easily traced back to you, you know? Yeah. These and murders share. <laughs> Sorry, I can't imagine, like, you know someone and you're like oh yeah they're safe you know what i mean and like yeah these murders shared some horrifying parallels with the exception of one all seven of the victims were prostitutes Mm. they were mutilated raped strangled and stabbed to death after that oh this gets sorry it gets real awful okay like more awful than it has been (laughs) after all of that gillis then dumped their remains in remote areas far from baton rouge when police found the body of his sectum victim it was an extremely horrific scene he was described as a genuine serial killer by pramila burns who was a former district attorney Mm -hmm. They said she was on her back in a kind of balletic pose next to a dead end sign, which I thought was his humor in a very sick kind of way. Oh, my God. Can you imagine just like the horror of that and then to try and make a joke out of it? Like, you're, yeah. I can't imagine even being in someone's mind that thinks like that. I know. I... And that's that's good because then I know that we're never going to end yeah. up that way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, just on top of it all, you have to do that. Yeah. Ugh. The body of his sectum victim was found horrifically dismembered, according to East Baton Rouge's Sheriff's Major Brian White. He said that you could barely tell it was a human being. Even though bodies were found, there was never any evidence of a murder weapon, witnesses, or fingerprints. Gillis started all of his killings by strangling people using zip ties. The police had no leads on the assailant, which allowed Gillis to carry off his murderous spree. 
He would then carve off their... He would then carve off their tattoos or nipples and then slice off their hands or feet. Was that his, like, trophy? Even worse. I'll get to it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, (laughs) great. You're welcome. (laughs) Even worse, he performed sex acts on the dead bodies of his victims Such as taking a shower with one corpse and (gasps) painting another's nails while saving body parts as trophies and even ingesting their flesh. How have I never heard of this guy? That is insane. I know. In 2004, two. 2004. That's the year I graduated high school. After killing his last victim, he took dozens of photos of himself posing next to her dismembered remains. However, Sean Vincent Gillis also left a clue at the scene of the crime that would later come back to haunt him. Good. Yes. And this is so cool how they figured this out. He was caught by a muddy tire track next to the body of his last victim, which was a lucky break for the investigators because they had nothing else to go on. Oh, wow. The DNA didn't match anybody in the database, despite the fact that they had found hairs at the crime scene and had previously believed that Derek Todd Lee, who is another local serial rapist and killer, had actually committed Gillis's atrocities. Oh, okay. But the secret was in the tire tracks. Wow. How freaking cool. That's that's like some downright police work. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, literally. Yeah. Detectives captured the luckily uncommon Goodyear oh. tire treads on film and in molds. Local law enforcement agencies and Goodyear retailers teamed up to find everyone who purchased this specific brand of tire from Baton Rouge area retailers. Good on Goodyear. Then investigators ran DNA tests on the 200 or so individuals who owned the tires. And it turned out that Sean Vincent Gillis was their match. Oh my gosh, that's such a, like a, that's a really cool way to catch someone. Isn't that freaking awesome? Detectives interviewed Gillis at the initial interview that followed the DNA test in April 2004 and had a gut feeling that this was their man. The day after the initial interview, they carried out a search warrant at Gillis's home, which he shared with Lemoyne, who was still oblivious to his crimes. And they discovered numerous images of his victims there. Which, like, when I was reading that for the first time, and they're saying that Lemoyne was unaware, like, how does she not be, like, how do you, how are you not curious enough or go into all, like, cracks of your home, you know? Well, maybe she's just not psycho like we are. <laughs> Is she not clean? <laughs> well, Does I she mean, she don't have to put things away. Like I don't. He probably hit him really well, and you see so many times these serial killers have these long-term relationships. I mean, John Wayne Gacy, you know, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. There was another guy who had girls in i can't remember what his name was but he had a wife and a daughter and he had girls locked up in his shed outside like they're so good at putting on these fronts you know yeah i just it's just so hard to fit like it's just obviously i don't disbelieve her but i just i also find it hard to believe to not catch some glimpse of it you know Well, and I feel like she probably had some, like, 
red flags you know what i mean where like maybe yeah. one time he like dropped his mask or whatever but she probably i mean nowhere in your mind would you be like oh my boyfriend's this horrific serial killer you know what i mean you just be like oh he's an ass <laughs> yeah and i just always find it so odd that they murder people that they don't know as opposed to the people that are closest to them you know it just yeah, seems like it would like, be a better opportunity. Yeah, they can, like, compartmentalize it. It's so yeah, weird. Yeah. It's just how their brain works is just wild to me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But can you imagine that poor woman, like, when you find out that you were with, like, you were sleeping with this guy and you find out the shit he did? Yeah. I, I oh. would be in therapy forever. Yeah, because I mean, he was doing like you said, sex acts to these these yeah. women who were dead, and yeah. then you know, coming home and having sex with you, like, yeah, oh my gosh, that's just wild. Oh, the heaps and the jeebs. Although Gillis was now in police custody, their work in sorting through the graphic details of his killings were only getting started. Once in custody, he confessed to the murders as if he was proud and also yet sad of his accomplishments. Quote, I'm sorry I hurt people, but I would do it again. You let me out on the street and I'll find somebody before sundown. Oh, my God. If anything in my useless life comes out. Help the little girls today not to be the premature corpses of tomorrow. Unquote. Oh, that's chilling. Right? Oh my God. Oh, oh. Sorry. In 2008, Gillis was found guilty of many killings after giving such admissions to the police. He was sentenced to life in prison at that time without the opportunity for parole. He was sent to Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola, where he is still being held in maximum security quarters. And I have Good. some fun little quotey quotes from about where he's staying. Oh, okay. Um, it was said by Ken Pasterick, who is a communications director for the Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections. So he said, Sean Vincent Gillis is currently housed in preventative segregation at Louisiana State Penitentiary at his request. And due to him being a high profile inmate and labeled a serial killer. Preventative segregation is a maximum custody housing area, preferably a cell, which may be necessary because an offender's continued presence in general population is a danger to the offender's staff or the general public. Mm. Unquote. Which, like, I don't even think I can voice my opinions on that, but it riles me. <laughs> Burke Foster, a former professor at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette and an expert in Angola history, tells us that preventative segregation has two locations. Two tiers in the Camp F death row complex houses 38 of the more egregious inmates. And 78 more are housed at Camp D for a total of 116. Oh. Just interesting. Oh. Pastorik claims that while many detainees at Angola are required to work, Gillis is unable to do so because of his accommodations. What? He can enroll in classes, according to Pastorik, but he has decided not to. Gillis must spend the majority of his time confined because of preventative segregation. Good. Gillis is allowed outside of his cell at least two hours a day if he so chooses. People on this particular level can communicate with one another. Time spent with others outside of their cells is considered interaction. 
According to forensic psychologist John Della Torre, sensory deprivation can result from spending 22 to 23 hours each day alone with no outside stimuli. The request for preventative isolation made Gillis by The request for preventative isolation made by Gillis himself, according to Delatoire, <laughs> wouldn't change the potential severe consequences of being isolated for so long. Yeah. But it's possible that Gillis's existence in prison has had no impact at all. Yeah, I don't think someone like that is going to change. According to Delatore, Gillis's ego strength and narcissism may also be of such a degree that prison is not impacting him in any way that can be understood by him or others. Yeah, I can't imagine that. He's not he's not going to really learn anything, you know. Oh gosh, no. He won't even take classes. Yeah. He expressed regret after being imprisoned. Oh, I'm sure. And- and even communicate with a friend of his last victim. What? In this letter, he expresses regret once more, but he also writes in a cold and calculated manner. Do you want to know what the letter said? Yeah, because he only regrets getting caught. But yes, go ahead. He wrote, She was so drunk, it only took about a minute and a half to succumb to unconsciousness and then death. Honestly, her last words were, I can't breathe. I still puzzle over the post mo I still puzzle over the post mortem dismemberment and cutting. There must be something deep in my subconscious that really needs that kind of macabre action. Yeah, probably. Yeah. There is probably no single explanation for what was present in his mind at the time. No. But upon being requested by District Attorney Burns, Gillis did admit to wanting to have sex with his mother. Oh, God. The woman whose departure made him so angry and who adored him as a child. Of all, no one back then could have imagined what he would have become. Oh. And that is Sean Vincent Gillis. That was horrific. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Now I see why you messaged me earlier. Like, I'm continuously gasping. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, he is horrible. Yeah. Horrible man. Yeah. We were, uh, for our listeners, we were just on a podcast this past week. Um, I did not sign up for this and that's the podcast name. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, oh, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, (laughs) um, but I was telling her about, um, how, when I decide to do true crime, I really (laughs) go all out. (laughs) It's awful. I don't know why I do it to myself, but and us. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, that was it was very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It was well it was well told. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so nice of you. Sorry, I was laughing at a joke I have. Okay, tell me it. Ashley. Yes. How does the rock pee? I'm so bad at these. I don't know how. He dwains his Johnson. Oh my god. It's so bad. I think that's the worst one you've ever told. I'm going to tell the one from our Instagram. Okay. Hey, you can be the shark, okay? Mm. Okay, get it out. Yeah, let me pull it up. I'll be the octopus. Okay. Okay. Uh... If you'd like to follow along. 
<laughs> Join our Instagram. Okay. I'm the shark. Yeah. Anne, what's an octopus's favorite month? August. Oh. Oh, I was going to say October. Right. Uh, everything was a joke to you. Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. I know that's how they joke in your home country. My home country? Finland. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the reenactment we just did. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, I think that's all I have, though. Okay. I'm well, sorry. if you want more of us lovely ladies or the jokes that you can follow along with, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you would like to rate and review us, you can do so on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week. Bye. Bye.